All right, 99.9 Punk World Radio FM. You guys already know what time it is. And right here, we are live worldwide on the radio. And we actually have the founding member of Sum 41. And, of course, former drummer as well. We have Steve-O right here live on the radio station Airwaves. Steve-O, how are you doing? How are you doing this this morning, I should say, since you're out there in Australia? It's afternoon, actually. I'm doing well. I'm good. How are you? I'll do the best I can possibly be, just enjoying my uh, Wednesday evening, uh, talking to Canada's legendary drummer. So, I mean, it's, it's an absolute honor. Oh, shoot, that's funny. All right, yeah. <laughs> I, I know you're out there far. in Australia. I'm not going that I know far. you're. It's nice of you I to know... say. Thank you. I w you're most certainly welcome. I will say this, though. I know you're out there in Australia, but here in Canada, we are still claiming that. The legendary Steve-O as our own. So you can have me. They don't want me. You guys can take it. My, I, you know, I'm here. It's you know, Canada and 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 Australia. I think are are like weird siblings. So you know, I can be in both. I'm a bit. I've, although before I was here, I was in America. So I've been kind of around the. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where I'm going to be next. Right now, we're here. Like the old saying goes, Steve-O, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Yeah, okay. That's a... <laughs> <laughs> so, how you doing, man? What, what, do you want, what are we talking about here? You reached out to me. This is the first interview I think I've done in 10 years. <laughs> I, I yeah. Honestly, I had a lot of people hitting me up. A lot of people were actually super stoked about this. So, I'm going to dive right into it because I know individuals have been waiting and I got to take you back to the beginning of everything, man, in the year 1996, where you actually co-founded the band Sum 41 alongside uh, Derek. I was wondering if you could actually just tell us the story of the humbling beginnings and, of course, what actually made yourself and Derek decide to launch Sum 41 way back in 1996. Well, it started before then, right? So, because I was in... I remember uh, I lived in a different part of town than he did. And I remember once I was already in a band and I remember one summer, this kid, these two kids from like a different neighborhood started showing up in our neighborhood, which was weird. And there was one little guy and one big guy. And uh, we were like, who's that kid? Anyway, it turned out it was Derek and this guy Grant. And I think they had a drummer who lived in my neighborhood. Uh, I can't remember his name right now, but that's how I met them. They just started showing up on their BMX bikes and then they found out I was a drummer. And then they, after a while, I think they heard that I was okay, uh, better than the guy that they had. And so they asked me to be in the band called Casper, which was Derek's first band. Um, and so we did that for a while. And uh, I think we were kind of more like a Nirvana Weezer thing. And that's what, and then we went, and then, that would have been 1995, 1994, around there. And then we went to Warp Tour in 1996, and we saw, you know, No Effects and Pennywise and all those bands. And I think seeing that, we were like, okay, we got we have to be that kind of band now. And <laughs> we were still in Casper, and I remember we – we it is so funny because back in the day, like, it, there was very – hard lines between genres and it would be weird to just play a no effect song and i remember we started covering a song called um oh i can't remember how it goes but it's like one of their lighter softer songs from uh heavy petting zoo and everyone was like whoa what are you doing playing that one and it, i don't know it was awkward and weird but then we just decided okay it's not going to work if we're in casper we got to start a whole new band and so that's when we started Sum 41. Um, and the, uh, you know, the earlier stuff really did sort of, it was like that sort of skate punky type of thing. And I think it was me, Derek, this guy named Grant McVitie, and this other guy named, guy named John Marshall. And that might have been the original band, I think. I can't really remember but that's sort of how it happened and then we you know we we're skateboarding like i wasn't skateboarding i was awful at skateboarding i was good at holding the skateboard while everybody else skateboarded but we were listening to those bands and that we really got into that um the punk stuff but then and tell me to shut up if i'm talking too much but the oh other no thing, seriously i, I, I enjoyed just listening man 
The other thing that I remember is that through this, like if I got anything out of skateboard videos, which was not how to skateboard, um, Derek was actually pretty good. And then at one point we had this guy named Sergio, amazing skateboard, but me, not so good. But we watched a lot of skateboard videos and that is how, at least for me, and I think all of us, but at least for me, we got into sort of heavy metal because there'd be guys skateboarding to like Iron Maiden and stuff like that. And this is before YouTube and before, like they didn't play that on much music anymore. It wasn't on the radio anymore. And so we kind of discovered it through this roundabout way. And that's where that influence came from. It also came from skateboarding, even though traditionally I don't think it had much to do with skateboarding. So the influence, can, the heavy metal influence was there pretty much from the start as well. And it definitely shows as well throughout the songs throughout the years as well. And I got to say as well, like me personally, as when I was younger, I couldn't skateboard with crap either, Steve. So don't feel bad. I was I lucky mean, if I could land I, an ollie. No, I can't even do the ollie. I, I, I have no shame of it anymore. I've accepted who I am. But at the time, I was good at posing. I was a terrific poser. I was dynamite at posing. But uh, I couldn't do the tricks, you see. But um, it was like, I, and again, we were more into the music aspect of it anyway. I mean, I don't think no effects. I don't. I can't envision Fat Mike skateboarding. You know, I don't know if those guys did it either, although the music was associated with that. Um, but early on, I think no effects probably would have been the most uh, influential, particularly early stuff. I remember um, uh, Ribbed, the record, which isn't uh, the most popular album. It's an older one. I think it's from 1988. But that record was just like blew our minds because there's all that like starting and stopping and, you know, like. I don't even know what you call it, the little like little pulses that you do. I mean, that record, there's a song called Malachi Crunch that was that was like, we want to do this. This is what we need to do. And I think, you know, as time went on, we kind of maybe got a bit poppier towards the first album, but then I think returned back to that with Does This Look Infected, which I think that's my favorite album that we had. And speaking of Does It uh, Look Infected, that's actually you guys' second studio album that actually dropped uh, November 26th of 2022 that you actually had you featured on the cover as you were dressed up as a zombie. I was wondering if you can just break down not only the album, but of course this iconic album cover, man, because I gotta say, this, this the artwork is absolutely stellar. Why did we do that? Okay, we've skipped all killer, no filler. So you're jumping way ahead, but we can go back if you want. Because you like just jump ten years. But um, uh, that record was okay. I don't know. I think it's probably Derek's idea to do the zombies. Either Derek or Dave. I don't remember. And they're like, let's do zombies. We'll dress up like zombies. And I remember we did the photo shoot in England, and you know had the full prosthetic makeup and stuff on there. And we had a bunch of fans come. I still have a bunch of the original Polaroid somewhere around here. Um, and it was it was fun. Like it was it was a very silly sort of interactive. Uh, like I don't remember doing many album covers like that where we had full production. But um, uh, I think when we got the record, and I think Derek had already thought of the title does this look infected i remember him saying like what do you think of this as a title and we're like oh that's good and then we saw just because when you do these photo shoots they present you with you know dozens of of different photos throughout the day and we saw that one and that's just me pointing at my head and and with the does this infected title it just worked so that's how i mean it, it was there wasn't it, we just thought it was funny you know and i think at that time in particular, like we would just like, be like, oh, that's funny. Let's do that. Um, like the first, so jumping back to All Kill and All Filler, the original album cover for that is just us shaking our faces into Polaroids, which is just something stupid we used to do. And then I can't remember whose idea it was. I think it might've been our A&R guy, Louis Largent's idea. I, I could be wrong. I don't have the best memory, but somebody, somebody was like, that should be the cover. Put all the, because we had tons of them. And uh, somebody was like, just put those. That's the cover. That's the cover. And we said, oh, that's funny. Let's do that. And I thought at the time, too, there was uh, all the boy band stuff was really popular, like NSYNC and Backstreet Boys. All that was very popular. And we just put the ugliest 
photos of ourselves on the cover of the album. We thought that was funny because given how, you know, everyone else was behaving at the time, it was just a funny way to approach it. And speaking of all killer, no filler, one of the songs I have to bring up is your guys' iconic song, In Too Deep. And I do know, obviously, you guys spoke about this probably many times because it is one of one of one of the biggest Sum 41 songs. But that's the music video itself, man. It was such a just an amazing aspect how you guys were doing the diving, the diving battle, I shall say, and uh, you know, just the drumming and everything in the water. I have to ask, like, who came up? I'm sorry, who came about that concept? And of course, what was it like just performing in the water in that pool? Like, was it difficult? Like, how, how did that actually go down for you guys? I mean, like, so that song, I mean, it's not, it's funny that that's one of the, the biggest ones. Like, that's not, like, it's a good song. It's not my favorite Sum 41 song, but I love the video. And the video idea, if I remember correctly, was also from our a &R guy, Louis Largent, who, um, <laughs> he just said, like, have you ever seen this back to, back to school with Rodney Dangerfield? And we're like, oh yeah, the eighties movie. And he was like, what if you, um, you guys, and, and we actually were going to get, we tried to get fat Mike to play the role of Rodney Dangerfield in, in the video. And he said, no. And, uh, and I, and, <laughs> but still, in which I, I have talked to him and he said he did regret that, but I don't know if that's true or not. But anyway, he did say that to me once, but we were wasted at the time. Um, so I might not be remembering it correctly, but the idea, I think they come from Lewis. He came up with a lot of good ideas. Like we originally, not to jump around too much, uh, like when we were, were getting signed and I don't know if the other guys have already told all these stories or not. So I might just be repeating what they've said, but, uh, like we weren't going to sign with these guys. We went, we were convinced we were going to sign with this other label. Cause we were like, we're going to go with them. And they took us out to this fancy dinner and we were just like this, like we were 18 when we got signed. We went to this, like, it's like we spent thousands of dollars on dinner. And I was like, oh, this is it. Like we should sign with these guys. This is going to be terrific. And then we said, okay, if we're going to, if we're going to sign with this label, we'll just keep meeting all the other labels so that they'll keep buying us dinner. Like that was all we were thinking. And when we met the guys from Island Def Jam, we met them at a subway. And we're like, who the hell? who the hell are these turkeys who've taken us to get sandwiches? We just had a $3,000 meal the other night with the guy from Atlantic or whatever the hell it was. And anyway, after talking to them for a minute, we were like, oh, okay, actually, these guys are actually kind of cool. I think we like these guys. And I think ultimately it was the best decision, like the amount of luck and just lucky choices of who we pick. Because I think if we sign with that other label, you know, they just would have forgotten about us and moved on to the next thing. Whereas these guys were actually good. It was Rob Stevenson and Lewis Largent. And they were both new a and um, And that you could tell that they were super into it and they're hungry, but they're also creative and funny and totally got the band. And I'm glad that we went with them because like Rob was great. Lewis was great. But Lewis also just came like um, the Into Deep idea was Lewis. And I think the Still Waiting idea was Lewis. Um, and if you listen to the beginning of All Killer No Filler, the intro, the voice at the beginning, that is Lewis as well. He used to, he was he passed away last year, which is tragic, but he he was an awesome guy. But he um, he he did the voice. He was a radio guy. He was on MTV back in the '90s, and he had this great sort of baritone voice. And he's the intro to All Killer No Filler. So I mean. Getting back to then into deep, I know I'm jumping around. Sorry, um, it was the video itself was fun. I mean, huge production because the fat lip video, same director Mark Classfeld did that video, and uh, and Mark did all of our good best videos every time, at least when I was in the band. Every time we tried somebody else, it wasn't as good, but the early stuff with Classfeld was, was spot on, and the fat lip video was you know. I don't even know what the budget would have been, but that video, I remember if you watch that video and you watch Nelly Country Grammar, it's the same video because we saw the Nelly Country Grammar video and we were like, that's a cool video. We want that, but with like punk kids, like 
And if you watch them back to back, they're very similar. Same director. It's the same guy. And it's his style of doing that kind of documentary sort of crazy visual style that we went with. But then, so that was, you know, and it was fun. We did Paint for Pleasure and all that stuff. But when we did Into Deep, it was it was much more of a production. We were, cop, you know, a, you know, parodying this movie. Um, and we did the, the same swimming pool that they shot the movie. And then the next day we did the um the performance part in the pool and some like in the dry pool and all the okay so to to mimic the triple indie which is the move i do at the end that's the climax of the movie and the climax of the video and i'm hopping between each one like they, where there's like a stunt guy and then he was doing flips from one to the other and then the next day i was in the speedo just bouncing on a trampoline in the backyard and people were just remarking at how like white I was because <laughs> under the California sun with the reflecting thing, and I was reflecting the reflection. It just, I, you know, I, it's not known for for me looking great, but it's funny. And also around this time as well, you guys were actually known for performing almost three hundred times per year, holding global uh, concert tours uh, lasting over a year or more. I was wondering. If you could just like tell us a bit more about what it what is a typical day like on the road for an individual like yourself that was performing almost every single day, never being a million thousands of miles away from home. Like, what did a normal day consist of? Obviously, other than performing. I don't know. Is that true? I mean, it would it's close to that, especially in the early days. There were just so many. <clears throat> it depended on where we were in the in the. Uh, stage of the band like when we first started we were in a van um and that was fun but only if you're 18 i mean like i you know i couldn't do that now it was really fun when i was 18 to tour in a van we crashed one we you know like we we did all the ridiculous things that you can do but that is something that you want to do when you're 18. once we got into a bus uh which was you know i think right before fat lip came out like that year we were on the campus invasion tour um with american hi-fi and uh, saliva which were other bands that were on the label like a weird like roster of bands to play together but it was really fun and it was probably 2000 and that was the first time we we're on a bus and it was just chaos and debauchery because now you're 20 and you're on a bus so you're just drunk all the time and acting like an idiot as time went on i mean i think we might have started touring maybe not that much but still a lot but then you're internationally doing stuff and so i don't know i mean towards the end of my time in the band like we would i don't know we spent so much time in europe and i was like well i'm never coming back here so we just do like sightseeing and like we'd still be hung over and you know we're still that sort of like stupid in, in, in the night and sophisticated in the day kind of thing. And we'd go and look at, go to the Louvre or something like that, or go to Red Square in Moscow or whatever, and then do it all over again. Every country is different. In Japan, you take trains everywhere. In Australia, you fly everywhere. In Europe, you travel in really weird double-decker buses. In America, you're in like a, I don't even remember what those buses are called, but they're the nicer ones. And also as well, uh, October 12th of 2004, you guys actually released the third studio album, which is honestly my personal favorite record that you guys actually put out by the name of Chuck that was ultimately uh, named after a UN Diplomatic Republican of Congo, uh, which I, I know a lot of individuals already know the story. You guys were filming a documentary, but I was wondering if you can actually just break down your time actually out there filming this documentary. And of course, what ultimately led to this being named after a, a UN officer? Chuck Peltier. Um, <laughs> I don't even know, it seems so crazy that that even happened, to be honest, because like the, the documentary series was War Child Canada, and it was called Artists in the War Zone. And like, why anybody would be like, yeah, I'm an artist, I wanna go to a war zone, I, just, I don't know. That's what we chose to do. And clearly at the time, it at that exact time we went there, it had been a war zone, but wasn't. And then when we were there, on the I think one maybe the seventh day we were there, you know, sort of all hell broke loose. 
And I remember Dave, like I, we can, you can hear the machine, the machine gun is going off. And Dave was like, I just think it's construction. And we're like, I don't know. Really? And then I went downstairs into my room, which was beneath the kitchen or with the restaurant where everybody else was in the hotel. And then I just heard, we all heard like tons of machine gun fire. And then all the chairs went, Arr! everybody rushed downstairs. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's a crazy story and it's kind of turned into a, like a wild road story, but you know, it's, it's awful. It's, it was an awful thing to, you know, have to see people and do it. Like we had the luxury of being able to leave, you know, and just be like, Oh, I guess we can, we can stop filming the documentary now. But I mean, all, everybody else we've been talking to the whole time had to stay and just deal with the fact that, you know, their world was going to be completely disrupted beyond their control for however long. So, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it is crazy, and it's the closest that I think any of us have ever come to a situation. That, you know, if you're from Canada, you, you never encounter anything like that, really. I mean, like, maybe there's a fist fight or maybe there's a car wreck or whatever, but, like, no one's shooting bombs at you because they're pissed off about something, you know? So it's it it's it was it was wild. I mean, it it we had the reason why we named the album after Chuck. Like we, this guy was there. He was this big guy, and he was he was kind of funny. And we would see him at breakfast at the hotel we were staying at, and everything. And then when all all hell broke loose, you know, he, you know, basically took it upon himself because we were all staying in the hotel. He was like, "I'm like I'm." He was in control of like the situation because none of us know what we're doing. And it wasn't just us there. It was us and UN volunteers and diplomatic people from America and Belgium and all these other places. And, um, you know, they basically wanted to get us out of the hotel and, and take us to the UN compound, which was down the road. And we'd been there filming, you know, victims of the war and child soldiers and, you know, all form of nasty awfulness. And, uh, and so in our heads, we're like, is this what's coming up the hill, like at the hotel, like the same people we've been interviewing for the past week are, is like a different, is another, are they, not those people, but people like them, people who are milit like, you know, like brought into some army and forced to do stuff. Are they coming at us right now? And, um, fortunately they didn't attack our hotel, but they attacked every other hotel. I don't know why we got off and we were evacuated i remember all the guys left and an armored personnel carrier these these un peacekeepers showed up and there was no room for all like there's a scene in the in the document we're all running up the stairs and i think a, like you can hear a bomb go off like it was right there it was so intense and we go up the, the 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 up to the top level where the main section of the hotel was and where all the armored personnel carriers were and everybody got into the car and, I, and my buddy, George Vale, who was filming, was like going to be left behind. So I said, well, I'll just stay with George. We'll get the next one. And so everybody else left. I stayed with George and I, I just assumed there'd be like another car. But then like 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 cicadas, you know, like it, like the gunfire would just go up and down and up and down. And it went up and they're like, oh, they're not sending any more armored personnel carriers. So I was like, oh, no, I'm stuck here. And uh, and and. George and I just sat there with a few other people. And then finally, about half an hour later, a car. It was a car. They sent us a car. I got in a Toyota. And it's like, is this bulletproof glass? They're like, no, it's not bulletproof. And then so me and Vale get into the car. And I just remember this woman, she was a Belgian, you know, uh, ambassador type person. She got in the car. You can hear guns going off. And she goes, oh, I forgot my phone. She gets out of the car and like walks back into the hotel. Look, we're gonna die. This is before iPhones. This is before flip flop. Like it was, it's like a Nokia. I was gonna die for this woman's Nokia. Anyway, I get driven back to the compound. I see all the guys, like, oh my God, Steve. I'm like, oh, we almost died. And then we just stayed in the compound for, for, um, for like three days until they could evacuate us. But when we were in the hotel and all the bombs were going off, we said to Chuck, Chuck, if you get us out of this, we're going to name the album after you. And he did. So we did. And that's why it's called Chuck. That's why it's, it's, it's the, and then he came to a few of our shows after and he's, he's a wild man. He would just come and get, 
you know, he'd come and get hammered at the shows and go mental, and he was he was fun. He was fun. Well, at least you know you don't have to worry about anybody actually jumping on stage and you know doing anything to you guys when Chuck's around because it sounds like Chuck know, is Chuck, a one hundred ten. I think I think Chuck is a bigger Sum Forty One fan than all of us, to be honest. Yeah, with maybe. You. I don't know. I, don't, I think we gave him a gold record. I think he's got a gold record. I don't want, maybe think that. I think that um, that's true. I hope that's true. If not, somebody mailed Chuck a gold record. And also, just stepping away from Sum 41 for a minute, because I do know, obviously, the fourth album came out the same year, but in 2007, you actually recorded drums for not one but two songs for Avril Lavigne's album, uh, The Best Damn Thing. I was wondering if you can actually just tell us a bit more about working with Avril Lavigne. I did? Okay. Uh, I don't remember that. Uh, I think... It might have been just because Derek, Derek might have produced those ones. I don't really remember that, to be honest. It was a bad education, bad situation. <laughs> was it that song? I, I believe so, yeah, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I, I, li I like Avril Lavigne. I'm, I like Avril Lavigne. I just haven't listened to her music in a long time. So if, if you say those are the songs, then definitely. The whole clone thing. Are you on with the clone thing? I, what is this? That is the craziest thing when you know someone and then you're watching online that it's become a conspiracy. There's some conspiracy theory, conspiracy yeah. theory about someone that you actually know. It's a very strange situation. But anyway, I think she's real. Um, that record, I think they needed a drummer and the, all the actual professional drummers were busy that day. So they called me and I remember I went to their house. They had this big house in, in LA. And I think I recorded it in their, you know, the, the great room of the, of their house. That's all I remember about that one. So I actually forgot that I did that. Was that in 2007? Uh, 2007. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't well, even remember there was a 2007, so I don't remember that. <laughs> uh, I, I should say that's the year the album came out, so maybe it was like recorded previously, obviously before 2007. Okay, well, I, I don't know. So did it do well, that album? I, I, I assume it did. Is that the... Which, I'm, assume, which I'm assuming so. Let's assume... Uh, that was... <laughs> what was the hit off of that one? Is that the boyfriend one? Ah, uh, I want to say I want to say yes because I do know her first album was actually Skater Boy and Complicated. So I want to say this is probably the boyfriend album. So this is the one in between Skater Boy and there was a middle one. I am going to be hundred percent honest with you. I'm not a huge Avril Lavigne fan. I know a lot when of the you, listeners are going to rip me. <laughs> me. You said you did tons of research, and you, sir, don't know enough. <laughs> Whatever. Where do you live, sir? Where do you live? Where is this station? Prescott. And how far Prescott, is that? Prescott, Ontario. How far is that from Kingston? How far? I would say about a hour long drive. I would say about an hour long drive. Pretty rural around there. That's Avril Lavigne country. You should know. You should know. Okay. Because that's like, you're probably right next door to, what is it, Napanee? Is she from Napanee? Is that where it was? I believe so. Na Napanee, yeah. I would say Napanee is right. Napanee is right beside Kingston, so I would be like attack on another fifteen minutes on that. So about an hour. Oh, it's fifteen minutes further. Ah, yeah, Napanee's further. You're fine. If it was I'm fifteen minutes forward, like closer, I think you'd be in trouble. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't know a ton about her catalog either, but I do remember doing one song. If it's two, I have no recollection of two. I remember one. Hits girlfriend when you're gone. Thank you, Craig. Craig knows. I didn't realize people could chime in. Oh, and it says you've won three awards. There you go. Look at you. Yeah. Oh, good for you. All right. So what else? What, okay. So we're at 2000. What have we missed here? We've done 2000. So 96, all killer. We didn't even ask and then we no spoke about uh, we spoke about uh, Chuck as well, and uh, also. The fourth album, Underclass Hero, dropped July 18th of 2007. I was wondering if you could actually just break down this amazing, legendary record. And of course, what was it like recording the song, The Walking Disaster? Because that song, to me, is honestly a song that saved my life and probably millions of other Sum 41 fans as well. Really? Um, what was it like? I mean, that's kind of... I stopped. What happened? There? Did Dave leave there? 
Dave left. That was the big thing that happened because he wasn't on that yeah. album. Right? So the big shift was that Brown Sound left on that one. Um, did Derek produce that one or did somebody else produce that one? I believe he actually produced the entire record, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so that would have been his. <clears throat> Here's how recording albums went when I was in the band. Drums get done first and then I leave. I have no idea what happened after I was done. We did a bunch of pre-production and rehearsing together. And then we went, I remember we were doing uh, pre-production in the Valley in LA. And I just remember we're next to this real top-notch bagel shop. That's all I remember. Uh, and then we recorded the record. I don't even remember where, maybe at Cello in LA, maybe. I think it might be called something different now. Northwest, Southwest, Kanye West, something like that. It's It was called Cello back in the day. And uh, we th I think we recorded it there. But I would have just done the drums and then... I just, I, you know, I didn't hang out much. So I, I don't know how it went after that. I kind of, I left. So I don't, I mean, what's, what songs are on that record? I don't remember that record so well. I remember Under Class Sierra. I remember doing the video with Klasfeld, which was fun. Uh, the video for Walking Disaster, I remember this. So I can't remember who directed that, but there's like a robot or something in it. And, and yeah. it, it we performed in a toy store in downtown LA. And at some point towards the end of the video, someone, maybe the director, maybe Cone, I don't know, someone would have been Cone, but somebody was like, okay, what if we just like start smashing the toy store? And so we ended up trashing the toy store. And <laughs> I don't think the owner of the toy store was in on that aspect of it. So it's downtown LA. It's got these shutters that like metal shutters that close uh, the, the, um, the store off. And he just shut up. He's like, you're locked in here now. <laughs> like he trapped us in there and then didn't like, I don't know. I think we had to call the police to let us out. I mean, it was very bizarre and I, I we paid for everything. I mean, we, Worked it into the budget, but I just think this guy's idea of the trash in my store uh, really offended him. So I remember that. Um, I don't remember too many other songs off that record. Like, what are some other songs off of there? I know Best of Me was on there. Uh, Pull the Curtain, I believe King of uh, Constitution. I remember that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah Constitution, yeah. And it's then funny. With Me as well. Well, it's another amazing one. With Me. How's that go? I think best of, no. Is that the one that goes do dun dun do ba do dun dun do ka? Is that that one? Yeah. And it's uh, pretty much like it's kinda of, kinda of like a slower, slower no, song. But the thing about us is like every time we did a slow song, except for pieces, we would be we'd like overcompensate for the slowness by making it louder. Yeah. And so like it, it was this like power ballad kind of thing. I think I I'm gonna be honest, Steve. If I, if I would have started singing, people would have left. So I, that's why I was just like, it's right. a slower song. <laughs> it's a slower song. So I mean, I, somebody like I don't, I haven't listened to it, like a lot of this stuff in a long time. So I get, um, uh, you know, now that I've, I've been posting things online and me playing drums and things, and so people are chiming in, and they will say, "Oh, you're drumming on this one is awesome," and I. I'm like, oh, I don't remember that song. So pull the curtain. Somebody emailed me about that the other day. And I honestly haven't listened to that song since we recorded. I don't think we ever played it live. I don't think. I know we played King of Contradiction. Um, as like, like I, like uh, that record and Screenplay Murder. Like it's like murky. Like I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember those ones as well. Um, but you know, it's, you know, I think a lot of people like that record. My favorite two, for my personal favorite, is is Does This Look Infected and Chuck. Like those two were the ones that I really I liked. Um, you know, but they all had had had, had moments, like great moments. I think the production. I definitely agree. Production on that, I think Derek did a good job with the production on that. Like the the sound of it sounds good, um, and Scream Bloody Murder sounded really good. Because yeah, I remember seeing a video that Derek posted. I believe, it, obviously, it was on YouTube uh, years ago, but he actually showed how he broke down 
the production and what he added into uh, The Walking Disaster. And if you really watch that, there's so many elements that he actually put into that song, like so many little little pieces that actually make that song true, truthfully what it is. Yeah, I mean, he was doing, like, he was into all that stuff since <clears> high school. <throat> Like he's been doing it for years, and all the t like now that I'm recording, I probably should have been paying more attention because I'm like, how do you record drums and make them sound good? But he was into it and the sort of science of it, and Cone too. Um, but Derek was really into to the, the 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 production of it ever since. I mean, he started going to this place. I don't want to speak for anybody, but I just as an aside, uh, I think like he started going to this studio called signal the noise like in when we we're in high school like he would go to toronto um and work and he has like a you know like a what do you call it like instead of going to class you go and work at a job and he picked a studio and they they you know and i, I don't know how like he probably knew more than the guys working there but he he learned a lot there he, he was doing stuff there so he's been doing it for long enough to really know how to pull it together now um yeah, I remember those ones sounded really good. They sounded good, those two records. You got a guy in here asking if I'm drinking Blue Power Raid. Just want to say no, it is actually a bottle of water. It's just the glare with the light here in the studio. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. But also, I know you said you don't remember a lot about uh, Screaming Bloody Murder, but I have to at least bring it up because I know we just talked about every single album that you were a part of. And obviously, this is the last album that you were a part of. And I was wondering, from what you actually can recall of this album... I was wondering if you can actually tell us a bit more about it. And, of course, do you actually remember Tom, uh, Thomas Thacker of Gob, actually coming in and joining the band for this last album? Because I do know he's not in any of the songs, but with that being said, he also is actually included within the album art, and he was indeed a part of the song, a part of the band at that current at current time, sorry. Tom was in the band? I, I believe so, yeah. From, from, what I, from what I read, actually. I, I know! Brown Tom, of course. No, he was, <laughs> I think he... Okay, so Tom arrived. At, so we needed a guitar player, and we held sort of auditions at SIR Studios um, in LA. And we and and you, you the way that you I, you know we'd never had to do that before. <clears throat> and um, there's kind of like an agent, you know, there's like that you can hire that either management must have found this person who finds musicians and brings them to the audition and you play a song with each person and then they come and they one after the other. And I think on his own volition, Tom arrived and we were like, I think Tom is here, like from Cobb. It is weird because we used to play with them all the time and we we're all friends and everything, but like, we just, we didn't know, we weren't expecting him. And then he showed up and just like, like shred, like it was amazing. We, he's, he's awesome. He's an amazing guitar player. Um, and he could play the piano, and he's this lead singer, Gob, so he could sing. So we were like, oh, wow, that's really fortuitous. Because all the other people who auditioned, they were, it was not right. And it was the first audition we'd held. So then we were like, I think this this could work with Tom. So he, yeah, I mean, he became a, like like a, like instrumental. And I, and I know that even on the Underclass album, there's piano and stuff, so he could do that. Um, and then for for Screenplay Murder, I know that he, at least I think he wrote some of the riffs. Um, he was involved in that way. I can't remember if he performed on the record or not. I do know he, he did some uh, co-writing as well, if I'm not mistaken. He did do he some was, co -writing. Yeah, I think the Screenplay Murder riff might have been his, but I, I don't remember. So don't, like, my word is a gospel. You'd have to ask somebody with a better memory but i know that he was involved for sure um which is great i mean we loved gob i mean i remember when i was a kid watching gob videos on you know on much music and being like this is awesome like they always look so fun um so i mean they were they were influential to the band and then he became a member of the band which was great i mean all those guys gabe and theo like we were we were um you know we're, um, I think Steven, is Steven the bass player now? I mean, well, he's been for the last... Uh, uh, St Steven Fairweather, yeah, of uh, Stranger yeah. Radio, yeah. <clears throat> so he, I can't remember the name of the bass player. When we first started touring with him, was it Craig? can't remember, but then Steven joined, I don't know, 15 years ago, so he's been in there forever. They're all great guys. 
And Tom has a lot of energy because I, I follow him on Instagram. So I know like they go out on tour and then he goes out on tour again with God. I think they just yeah. were in Kingston. Did you go to the show? I, I did. I was actually front row. Gabe actually gave me a shout out as well. He actually like literally said, thank you for coming out, DJ Immortal. And I was like, oh, shit. Okay, like, put me right. on the spot. But I loved it. Was that with Billy Talent? Billy Talent, yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that would have been – so that record – I mean, there were some great ones off of that record. I remember uh, – I mean, we were nominated for a Grammy for one of the songs. Um, what was that one called? Blood and Murder. Uh, Screaming Bloody Murder. No, 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 no. The record was Screaming Bloody Murder. The single was Screaming Bloody Murder. But then the other song, Blood in My Eyes – is that what it's called, Blood in My Eyes? It's got like a real heavy riff. Um, that one, I think, was nominated for a Grammy, which was like, what the hell did that even happen? I have no idea how that happened. And we lost to the Foo Fighters. Uh, they uh, won uh, for uh, White Limo, I think, for best hard rock song. But anyway, I still have the... And, I, and I still think, even to that day, I think that's Highway Robbery. You guys definitely should have won. Nothing on the Foo Fighters. You know, Dave is a phenomenal musician, but I really think you guys deserve that one. I don't know. I mean, we would, we, I don't, like, maybe things are changing now, but we would consistently lose uh, awards. I mean, we won a few, which was fun, but, like, I remember for the longest time, we would, we would be up against Nickelback, and Nickelback kept winning, and then they kept saying, we just want to share this award with our brothers in 741. I was just like, you know, you, you can have this one. Well, you know, like, you guys can have it now. It's yours. It's yours. Um it doesn't really matter, to be honest, but it was, uh, I just, that is another sort of memory from that record. It was a good album. It's, 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 it's a heavy one. It was good that it was heavy. <clears throat> I mean, it's funny that they kind of go light and heavy, light and heavy. I mean, All Killer No Filler was kind of light, although it's got some heavy ones on it. Um, and then does it affect the Chuck were kind of heavier, and then Walking does that, whatever that one, Underclass Hero was lighter. And then Screamer Murder was heavier. And so it sort of vacillates between the two. Um, but I liked that one. That was a good one. And this quite next question I have is a question that I've been wondering since April 18th of 2013. And I know tons of fans have always wondered this as well. You announced via Facebook and Twitter that you were actually leaving Sum 41. And one of the biggest questions is throughout the years is why did you actually decide to part ways from the band? Uh, if you don't, if you don't want me asking, I do know it might it might be a touchy subject. No one really knows the real reason. So if you do want to skip it, you definitely can. No, I won't. I'll, I mean, I'll say like honestly, as, you know, Cone is a diva, and I couldn't handle dealing with <laughs> with his bullshit anymore. To be honest, I'm kidding. Cone's lovely. I'm just joking. <laughs> I I don't know I I, I listen I, it was it was a weird time uh, and I guess for me I mean without getting too deep in it I mean I had a baby at home I had a family at home I had a new like little tiny person and I think for me personally I was burnt out like you said all the touring all the partying, all of that stuff had kind of, for me, I'm not going to speak for anybody else, had just gotten to the point where at that time, I just wasn't happy anymore. I was kind of like, this isn't bringing me joy anymore. I'm just kind of unhappy with where I'm at. Uh, and, you know, I had this little dude at home and I just kind of was like, okay, I'm going to do that for a while. Uh, I would like to focus on that. And so, so I did, and I didn't. I didn't uh, play for years. Like I was so burnt out that I mean I didn't even play the drums for about eight years. With one exception, I played three shows with the Vandals because if the Vandals call, I'll go right. Uh, and they went through the roller deck. Okay, Josh is busy. Brooks is busy. Byron's busy. Adrian's busy. Like they finally got to me. They're like, Steve, can you do it? And I said, Yes, I'll do it. Where are we going? They said, We're going to Cleveland. I said. Where else are we going? They said, we're going to Hawaii. I said, I'll do that one. So I did Hawaii. And then I did three shows with them in Europe. Um, <clears throat> and that was the only time I touched a drumstick in eight years. And then, you know, I mean, I just wasn't involved with it at all. I wasn't into music at all. And I didn't think I'd ever play again. 
And then, you know, we moved to Australia and, you know, the pandemic happened and I was like, what can I, like, what am I going to do? <laughs> and we had like a, there's a basement at this house. I was like, oh, that's kind of a good place for a drum kit. So I bought a drum kit. And then I sat down behind the drum kit and I was like, oh man, I'm not very good at this. <laughs> it's like, it had been a long time. And also I just, I was really rusty, but I think, you know, I wanted to get back into it because I think there's a lot of things I wish I could have done back in the day. And now I was like, okay, I'm going to try and rectify that. I want like now with the internet and YouTube and everything, you can learn all this great stuff. So I kind of got back into it just for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's fun to get back into it now, but the reason why I left back in the day, I mean, I just, for me personally, like where I was at, I just was like, I, I just don't think I can do this anymore. At, at the time, I just couldn't. And also as well, as the world knows, and I know you know as well, that uh, Sum 41 announced that they're disbanding, uh, and this is going to be the last album in a world mega tour coming up. Uh, one, of the, one of the questions I actually had coming in when I booked this interview was promoting it, that if, if you actually got the opportunity and got contacted by the band members to come back for a show or to play one more song with the band, since it is the farewell tour, would you actually uh, actually take them up on that offer and actually come back and reunite with the band for one show or even at least one song? I don't know. I have no, I, I, I can't really, I don't know. I'm not doing this to do that. I found out when everybody else found out. Woke up one morning and I saw the the the, the message from the band. I thought, oh, that's, that's crazy. And then I was like, aren't they putting out a double album? So, like, I assume it wasn't going to be the next day. But, um... I don't know. I mean, if who knows? I'm, I'm going to leave the door open, but I, I I don't have anything to really comment on that. I mean, I I don't know. I'll ask Cone when I talk to him, I, like when I Facetime with him, and in, in next week or whatever. So I mean, it's not really something that's on my mind necessarily. I get a lot of emails about that. I don't have an answer to that, um, to that particular one. As far as I know, there's no grudge. There's no animosity or whatever but i mean i i haven't like there's no plans and also as well totally away from the sum 41 days uh, obviously but today as well you also have another job that you actually do out in australia where you're actually a real estate agent and yeah, i know no, a lot of the fans right now what? i know a lot of the, I, I was wondering if you can actually tell us a bit more about that and what got you into real estate well that I no, I don't do that anymore. I did that when I lived in California. Um, so that happened kind of by accident. I was my wife and I, we lived in Palm Springs and we kind of got into um restoring these old mid-century modern houses. Like we'd buy them and fix them up. And at one point, my wife was like, Listen, we're paying these realtors, like somebody should do this. Like between you and me, like one of us needs to do this, we'll cut out the middleman. And she's like, but it needs to be you because I don't want to deal with people. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. And I happened to be at a, a barbecue at Josh Freeze's house. And his wife, Nicole, had just gone through the process. She's like, oh, it's easy. I'll, I'll tell you exactly how I did it. So I said, okay, if it's easy, I'll do it. And the idea was I would just be doing it on a personal, like just for me and my wife, just to buy things and sell them on a boat. And we just bought this mega fixer, like complete just whole like it just this place it was falling over it was actually marked for a teardown and we bought this place but it looked cool and we we're like this this is like a interesting uh project maybe like but it turned out to be a, like a nightmare project and i had my real estate license i helped buy the place the idea was that we would fix it up and sell it and like about three weeks into just like busting concrete and 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 like carrying like construction stuff, like it's backbreaking. And I was like, I don't, I don't do this. And then um, a friend of ours who was a, um, she was like the accountant on the Warp Tour. She was friends with my wife. She was friends with me. And she said, Oh, I heard you got your real estate license. Um, you should help me buy my house. And I said, Oh, I never even thought that I would help somebody do that. But we're friends. Like, why not? I'll, I'll give it a shot. So basically. Like I would drive up to where, you know, she was looking in LA, like Silver Lake, Las Feliz, those neighborhoods. And uh, and we would like look at houses 
And then I was like, do you want to buy this house? Do you want to buy that house? She said, no, not these ones. And then like three weeks later, we found one that she liked. So I said, oh, great. So I helped. I put in the offer. I did like, you don't really have to do anything. Like it's like, there's some work, but I mean, like you write the offer, you show up for the inspections, that kind of thing. And then everything went through smoothly, even though the other agent was a battle ax, but uh, he ended up selling the house or buying the house. And then they sent me this check and I was like, Hey, that's actually like a lot better than busting concrete. So I said to my wife, I'm going to do this now. You do that. You deal with the concrete. Because she wasn't busting concrete. She's like the foreman of the job, right? And I was just some lackey. And I was like, I don't I don't want to do that. So I ended up just falling into it. And it, it was one of those things where without actually, like it just sort of accidentally happened, where it just worked out. Like I had friends in the music business. And I, the guy that I was working with in Palm Springs, Paul Kaplan Group, were great. I knew him from before. He he actually sold us our house like five or six years before. And uh, it was it was just this easy. I think some people might have had this misconception that it was like a corporate gig. Like I worked from home in my pajamas. Like I would occasionally go out. People would just text me and you'd go have drinks. Like Palm Springs is fun. So it was more like it was weird because my experience in the band kind of helped in the sense that like I was just, you know, I went from partying in a band to partying with these people. And hey, you want to buy this? You want to buy that? Oh, you don't want to? Don't buy that one. You know, and then eventually they would. And it just kind of happened naturally and was fun. Um, but then the pandemic happened and my wife, who is Australian, uh, I think, you know, was, you know, we were sort of looking down the barrel of, how, you know, an endless lockdown in Palm Springs. It's a thousand degrees. And there was no COVID at the time in Australia. She always wanted the kids to come to Australia to have more of like an outdoorsy, you know, autonomous existence. And so we hopped on one of those repatriation flights and we've been there here ever since. So, and that is why, what kind of gave me the time. Like I didn't have anything to do. I couldn't work here right away because I didn't have my, uh, my, like the right visa. I was like waiting for my residency and that sort of thing. So I was just like, what am I going to do with myself? There's only so many times I can go hike with kangaroos. And so I got a drum kit. I was like, maybe I'll just get back into this and, and come back. Cause I wasn't really drinking anymore. I, you know, I needed some outlet and like something to become addicted to. And I just fell into doing this again, which is fun. It's like, fortunately now I have the, the, like the attention span to get into things that I, I couldn't do when I was 14 or 18 or 22 or whatever, you know, like I just, now I, I kind of want to go back and, and fix all that stuff for whatever reason. I, I think I'm having a midlife crisis. That's what I think's happening. Hey, but I got to say for us fans, I don't think we're actually complaining. I know most people go out and buy an expensive truck or something like that and surprise the wife and be like, I just spent our savings. But, you know, you're drumming and you're showing it for the world and, of course, your fans. So I don't think us fans are really going to complain. Yeah, instead right. of a red Corvette, I got a red drum kit. I didn't have any drums. I didn't own a drum kit. I got rid of everything. And so I had to buy it all back. I read that Bloody Mary Condo book and took it to heart and just, like, sold all my stuff. I was like, this is weighing me down. And then I had to buy it all back. So... And also, we, we have a fan question as well that I actually think is a pretty good uh, question. We got Craig Williams. He asked, has Steve-O been keeping up with uh, the band's uh, releases past Screaming Bloody Murder? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I not really. I don't think I, I have uh, listened to any of those records at all. But I also, I just didn't listen to anything. Like, I don't listen to modern music. I listen to, like you know, Astrid Gilberto and stuff like that. You know, I'm like, if it's old, like easy listening, like that's what I listen to. So I haven't really kept up with it, to be to be honest. I haven't. I've heard it's good, so I'm glad, but I haven't kept up with it. I know they put out a new song recently, but I haven't heard that either. I have to say it's definitely a, it's definitely a vibe of like all killer, no filler vibes. That's what it gives me. It kind of takes it back to like the beginning, in my honest opinion. The more yeah, pop punk it was like a bit of, it was gonna be both. Like I'd heard it was gonna be both. So yeah. you know, I've I haven't heard it. I haven't heard it. 
Um, when I actually he, first listened to it, it was actually kind of funny because the song randomly stops and it goes like at the last word is landmine, but it like uh, it, it makes it gives you the impression that it blows up. But I actually thought like I de- I purchased the wrong song because I bought my music. That's what I do. I normally buy the MP3s, and I was like, "What the hell happened to the song, dude?" But then I realized that's the end, so I was like, "Oh, I get it. It's like a landmine blowing up." <laughs> I see. You know, you buy the MP3s. I do, yeah. I honestly, I absolutely cannot stand streaming. I, I absolutely hate it. Um, I, I, I would, I would rather give the artist dollars versus pennies. In my honest I opinion, I know, and I agree with you. But it's so nice, like if you're just like. <laughs> I know where you're coming from. You're 100 percent right. However, I like if anyone was like, "What's the one like Netflix?" I don't care. You know any of that stuff? I don't care. But I, I, it's just having it right there. Because I remember back in the day, you know, because you know, I'm 42, so we we were we're like that weird generation. That's it's like the people in like 1890 who are like electricity wow and then you know all the way until the 30s there's cars it's like they're living in the future all of a sudden we're like pre-internet now like post-internet right on the divide i remember what it was like buying cassette tapes and you'd buy like you'd be like maybe i'm gonna get into jazz and you spend 30 dollars on something that just sounds like somebody like thwacking the ground with a bag full of you know doorknobs and you're like ah i just wasted 30 dollars whereas now you can try a million things and if you're just like dumpster di- or you know what do you call it uh not dumpster diving but like uh, crate diving sometimes it's like dumpster diving but like just trying different stuff and different styles and getting into different things i just it's so awesome so i know you're right i know you're right but i i i, I mean it's pretty awesome <laughs> And definitely having it at your finger, have, having oh, everything yeah. at your fingertips, so many it's, genres, I mean, just, it oh, is amazing. Yeah. I, will, I will definitely say that. Yeah, and I know, like, some people, like, I heard, I don't know if he's, you know, like, Neil Young was like, okay, I'm not doing Spotify anymore. I, Jay-Z, Jay-Z, you're in Australia, I, I, I'm in Australia, you're in Canada, we can call him Jay-Z. But he was like, I'm not doing Spotify, I'm doing my own thing. At one point, he was going to try his own thing. I don't know if he's back, I have no idea. But if you don't listen to new stuff and you only listen to old stuff. It's all there because nobody cares. And so they're like, yeah, yeah, take it. Take it. You want to listen to Stravinsky? It's there, man. Or whatever. So I don't know. I like it. I know it's wrong, but I, I, I confess that I'm I'm addicted to Spotify. Any other questions? We also another... Actually, we got one more fan question, which honestly, I actually missed this one. Are you still doing your stand-up comedy? Ah. No, you know what happened? I did that maybe in 2016, 2015. It was fun. I tried it. Oh, what happened was I got um, nodes on my vocal cords from doing it. And I remember like I just completely lost my voice. And I remember going to the doctor and she was like, you you have like nodules on your vocal cords. What have you been doing lately? I'm like, oh, I'm going to these things. I'm talking really loudly into a microphone and then drinking afterwards. And she was like, yeah, you can't do that. And so I had to stop. Um, and fortunately, like, because otherwise I would have to get surgery. And so I had to complete, like, that's kind of why, that's another reason why I was like, okay, I'm just going to do the real estate thing because I couldn't talk. I didn't want to play the drums. I was like, I, I just need to do something else. And so that happened naturally. But yeah, the stand up thing, I tried it, it's fun. Um, I have an immense amount of respect for people who do that because it's so hard. And I wasn't like, I dipped my toe into it. I just tried it, you know, like it's so hard because when you're in a band and there's four guys or four girls or four people or whatever, there's people on a stage with drums and amplifiers. If the show's going horribly wrong, you can just turn it up to 11 and drown out the audience that's heckling you. You don't stand up. It's just you. Like you're just there and you have to make them like laugh. Strangers laugh. Right away. It's, it's just so crazy. And I was able to make it work a couple times. And the rush you get from just like standing on stage and making a room full of people laugh just from what you're saying is exciting. But before the show and I was, you know, I never did any big shows or anything like that. I was doing low level stuff, but with people who are way more experienced than me. 
And I know what it's like hanging out in the backstage before a rock show. It's fun. You do a shot of Jameson. You put on like ACDC. You're hanging out. You're chatting. You're maybe warming up a little bit. But it's like the, the mood is light and, and like, you know, and fun and airy. Everybody, like not everybody. And I'm sure when you get to a certain level, it's more like that. But when I was doing it, everyone's kind of anxious and like, okay, going over their notes and thinking about what they're going to say. And their mind is racing. And I was like, this is really, really like, you know, intense, you know, and then you get off and it's fun and the people are fun and they're, and they're quirky and weird. Um, but it just, I, yeah, I don't know if it, that's the one for me, uh, but I do have like, it's, it, that is, I think the hardest performance art is that. Um, and if you can get it to work, like it's, it's, it's magic, but I, I, I don't know. It's a rough, it's a rough, it's a rough go. And it's so solitary in some ways too. Like it's just you, you know? And a lot of the people who I knew, like, like they're all bonkers. Like they've all got, you know, they're depressed or they've got like major anxiety. They got some wacky issue. Like the last person you want just to be alone with is yourself. And you, that's the, the the sort of road they a lot of them take. So I mean, it's I love stand up comedy. I mean, it's I love watching it, and I and it's fun to give it a try and kind of understand in some way what what they're doing. Like people who are really good, like oh, like I can see how they turn that into a bit, and the sort of mechanics behind it. It's like a magic show, really. Um, but I don't see myself. Like, I think I just blow up my voice again. I don't know. It was fun to try, but I don't do it anymore. And the last uh, fan question I'll take before I wrap things up is, uh, Starborn uh, wants to know, what is your favorite Sum 41 studio song and your favorite song to perform live when you were, of course, in the band? I think my all-time favorite one is Still Waiting. To the record, it sounds awesome, and to play live was awesome. So that's, that's that, to me was sort of was was the most that was the best one i mean it's just such a it's just it's a rocks that one is so good that one um and then like something like no brains like a deeper cut like that kind of thing was always fun to play it's a bit more uh, mr amsterdam uh was a good one um but my are those all from does this look infected i think all oh, yeah. three yeah okay that record is great um but I would say Still Waiting. Still Waiting is my favorite one by far. And I mean, Fat Lip too, because it's just so, like, it's, I mean, it's it's such a funny song. Like, the amount of, like, stuff packed into one song. Like, you've got a Beastie Boys reference. You've got a punk reference. You've got um, uh, the pain for pleasure thing at the end, which is like a, a nod to the heavy, like the, even the bridge is kind of like, like it sounds like the Pixies or something like, you know, like it's like that, like a, like an alternative, like it doesn't sound like it would fit, but it does. It was like, there's this sort of all these different things going on in one song. So that one's pretty good too. And the video is great. So fat lips still waiting and the still waiting video is hysterical. So those two um, would be up there for sure. One of my favorite Sum 41 songs of all time, honestly, is uh, Some Say, man. That song is just has such a powerful meaning behind it. The video is amazing, how everything is kind of like going in reverse. By far, one of, in my top three favorite Sum 41 songs. Really? Okay. I mean, that was uh, Shawn Michael Terrell directed that one, who's a friend of ours, director in Toronto, and Richie Curtin produced it. Um, it was some weird Scandinavian movie that they saw. It was fun doing the video because we're all dressed up in different characters and stuff. I, I honestly have not thought of that song in a long time. So I'd have to go. That was on Chuck, right? Uh, it was, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so that was one of the slower ones on Chuck. Chuck did like a lot of different, because Pieces is on Chuck too, right? Uh, it, Pieces, yes, it was. Yeah, I remember that. I remember those, it's kind of like a Der Derek's walking through the tunnel and. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that one, that record's kind of crazy too, because you've got a song like Pieces, and then you've got a song like The Bitter End, which is like the polar opposite. But that yeah, was yeah. something that I kind of always liked about the band is that, it, you know, we we were never into one thing. We always liked so many things. Before we were signed, we would do these um, 
we would do these uh, medleys of just like any like 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 songs from the '60s and like songs from the '80s, and we put them all together. And so we always had these 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 different influences that I that kind of gave the band more of a a varied you know sound. Whereas a lot of you know like ACDC just always is like exactly the same. You know, like certain bands always sound the same. Whereas we kind of had. I don't know. It was like ADD or something. We were just all over the place, but it, it worked. It works. But um, yeah, some say I've not thought of that one in a long time. That's one of your top three, eh? One of my top three. Yeah. What are your other top two? Did you already say? Because I, I, I don't remember. <laughs> Honestly, my other top two would have to be put me on the spot. There's so many amazing songs, man. So I mean, like, but I have the man here. So I would say "Walking Disaster" is probably in there. Yeah. Um, and honestly, I would say probably pieces would be in there as well. And it's not just because we just spoke about it. It's because I would say just the things he talks about, I've dealt with a lot of depression in my life, still kind of do outside right. of, you know, my, my radio station. So that song is kind of one of those songs that kind of helped me through a lot of difficult times. Cause I knew, okay, I'm not the only one going through this type of stuff. If someone, a mega star like Derek can go through this and be okay. I can go through this and be okay. So I would definitely say yeah, pieces yeah, I mean, is definitely yeah. in there. Yeah, we would get, I, mean, I still get messages and stuff from, from people who say things like that, which is great. Cause when you hear it, it's, it's like, okay, that's so cool. And I get people all the time. I mean, when I started playing the drums again, I got so many messages of people like I play the drums because like, maybe not just because of me, but partially because of me. And then I'll look at their Instagram page. I'm like, oh my God, this kid's better than me. So like by the time I've quit in the intervening time that I've got back into it, this person's like light years beyond where I am. So when we all, when we heard stuff like that, it, it was always, it's, it's good to hear. But those are interesting choices to me because those songs, like that's just not, like, like that's, it's, it's just cool to see how other people take it in and their own experience, like, you know, sort of dictates what, you know, their own experience is like, okay, these songs are meaningful to me. Those ones, like, yeah, mine are, maybe mine are just like, maybe because they're more fun to play, like, live. Um, maybe that's why I like them. Like, Still Waiting's fun to play. You know, Fat Lip was fun to play. Amsterdam, Mr. Amsterdam is fun. Like, it's just technically a little bit more demanding. I mean, it's not that hard, but I mean, it's just, there's a lot going on. So it's fun. It's just a bit more fun. So maybe that's why I was into those ones, but you know, teach his own. Oh, trust me, I, st I still love "Still Waiting," still love the Hell song, still love oh, yeah, that song. all those amazing joints. I forgot, but that one was good. that video was also good. We lost to Coldplay on that video, <laughs> which again, the thing about us is we kept losing, but then we would lose and we go, "Oh, that makes sense. That's a pretty good video." Like, cause the one where he's walking backwards, we lost to that one, but we had the dolls in that in that video. And you guys, like, I, I heard as well that you guys uh, got so many cease and desist orders as well because of what was faces you put in there. Well, like, we asked, did we? Because, well, we had we asked permission, I think. We had asked permission. And some people said no. But I think most people said yes, unless I'm forgetting. But but I but the way that video, again, in the early days, for sure, it was just so much, like, is that funny or is that? ridiculous we would just say oh yeah that's hilarious and mark Glassfeld sent a videotape of him holding the, like just his hands holding these dolls and it was like hey man are you going to some 41 country net yeah dude and then this went off on a skateboard and he was like this is my idea for the video and we're like that's the best video because everybody did that we all we made videos like that on our you know vhs tape back in the day like it's funny that's a good one forgot about that one was the label actually all for that video? Or were they like, man, I don't know if this is going to work. Like, you should try this. Or like, did they no, actually no, be like, no. you know what? No, they thought it was good. Like, back then, the early sort of regime of Island just got it. Like, they, that's why it was great. I think if we went with a different label, you maybe have people say, oh, I don't know. Or maybe, like, I don't think people get They got it. Like, that one was Klasfeld's idea. And we thought it was hilarious. And... Everybody else thought it was hilarious. So we went with it. Um, the one thing that I remember, and I don't, and, you know, and I see you want to wrap it up, but uh, like just to. Oh. I don't we, have a lot. You can stay as long as you want. I like eight <laughs> conferences, I got a fee, but. No, um, the, uh, the thing I remember about um, 
about the early, just at the beginning, there was an arc, not an argument, but they wanted In Too Deep to be the first single. And we we're like, it can't be In Too Deep. It has to be Fat Lip. Like, it has to be Fat Lip. And they're like, I don't know. It's, like, it's a weird song. Like, we just were talking about. And we said, it just has to be. And, you know, they eventually were like, okay, we get it. We're, we're going to do it. And they 100% like backed it. And I'm really glad we, because I think if you did it in reverse order, I just don't think it would have worked. I think it would people have been like, what the hell is this? Whereas Fat Lip is a better representation of like who we were at the time, at least, you know, the band's changed and like, but at the time that captured it, you know, whereas I think Into Deep, it was great. I'm just glad it was the second one. I'm glad it was the second video. Like, especially as well, like I, I find In Too Deep as well. If you put that out first, it would be hard to match it, in my opinion, with the, with the uh, my, you know, top tier production level as well. People might not have gravitated towards the Hell song as much if they would have saw, you know, In Too Deep first, in my honest opinion. Yeah, well, Hell song, that was, yeah. I mean, that was the next album, right? So, I mean... I don't know. I mean, I just glad that that's how it worked out in the early days. I mean, it just it was it was. It, I remember things changed after um, though the people who were at uh, Island left, like the guy who was at the helm was Leor Cohen, who's like the Beastie Boys, and and everybody under him, like everybody that went off and did their own thing. I mean, went to different labels and became presidents of different labels. Everyone did well, I think. Like all the original people we worked with. And then it kind of changed because I, I can't remember the name of the guy who took it over, took over Island after. He's on the TV show. He's a drummer. L.A. Reed took over and yeah. he just didn't get it. Like he was just like, uh, like he was, he, he didn't get us. Whereas I think he, he got all the massive, you know, rap and R&B and, and pop stuff. Like he, that he got. But I don't know if he knew what the hell to do with us. And that's kind of when it was like, I don't know. And so I don't know. I, I, I think the band's on a different label now, obviously. I don't know when. I don't remember when it when it ended with Island. But those original albums were great. Those original three were great. Great relationship with the label. They totally got it, which was awesome. So. And I got to say, Steve, obviously, I know individuals, like, the questions are pouring in, and, and obviously, we can't stay here all day. But for individuals that do want to follow you on social media, now that you're re back on the drum kit, you know, doing your amazing covers and whatnot, how can individuals follow you if they're not already doing so just to stay up on everything you currently got going on right now? Uh, well, they can go to my Instagram, which is the Stevo 32 uh, which is at the Steve, there's a, the <clears throat> STVO32. And then I'll do a YouTube because people are like, oh, we want to see full versions and other stuff. I haven't done it yet. We're, we're building an actual studio down here so I can just do more. So that's coming. Um, and I'll have that soon, but it's not ready yet. So just go to the Instagram if that's, if you want to see stuff like that. That's where I mostly hang out sort of online. Um, and then there'll be more coming. But at the moment, just go to the Instagram. And I got to say, first and foremost, Steve, before we part ways, I just got to thank you for this exclusive interview. Like you said at the very beginning, this is the first interview you did in over 10 years. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you're taking your afternoon out to speak with not only myself, but of course the radio station uh, listeners. So thank you so much for just, you know, clearing the air about why you left, talked about all these amazing albums that I grew up listening to. And most of all, Thank you so much for just being a part of these albums, because I can say if there was no Sum 41, there really would not be any DJ Immortal. So, Steve, -O, thank you uh, so much for the music you helped create. No worries. Thanks, buddy. Um, yeah, it's been nice talking to you. Hey, man. Likewise as well, Steve, -O, definitely have a wonderful day out there in Australia, and I'm sure we definitely shall talk again soon. But for now, have yourself a phenomenal day. All right. You too. Thanks, buddy.